Hello, everybody. Very pleased to, to have you on this uh, webinar on the, on the innovation in tomorrow's new worlds. And I'm very pleased to, to welcome our panelists, uh, Sabine Cloak and Hervé Gilibert. Sabine Cloak is the head of engineering at Airbus uh, Defense and Space, and Hervé Gilibert is a CTO at Ion Group. Myself, I am Vincent Montberger, the managing partner of uh, Arthur de Little uh, Paris. And uh, we will have a moderator with, uh, with us, which is Albert Mej, the CEO of uh, Presence. I will do a very short introduction. We've done a survey, actually, and thank you very much for a lot of you that have a response to this, uh, to this survey. And just is to set the scene and a type of warm up for the, for the panelists. We ask uh, some companies, and you have on this slide the different companies that have answered, uh, what is changing uh, due to COVID on, on innovation. So actually, it's uh, quite big companies, and uh, half of them uh, is working in aerospace defense, but 50% uh, of them is working in other type of industry. So the first uh, topic uh, that we have is that COVID has a high impact on innovation and even on R&D organization. As you can see uh, on the survey, more uh, that uh, I would say 70% uh, of the people have answered that innovation will have a huge impact and quite a lot of uh, reflection has done on R&D uh, organization and processes. On the second question, because one of the topic is, is innovation going to slow down because of COVID, what will happen? So actually, it's absolutely not the case. There is, I would say, an acceleration of the main trains uh, that was already uh, in place in innovation. Agility, uh, as you can see, open innovation, digitalization, and some skills that are changing quite quickly in the innovation. And in the same manner, the new type of uh, technologies are boosted by innovation. Obviously, what is robotization, distanciation, simulation, forecasting, and artificial intelligence technologies are, uh, I would say, the top winner of uh, what is happening currently. In terms of, uh, of perception, so actually, and probably there is a little bias in this survey because the people that have answered to this survey obviously are very involved in, uh, in already. But innovation seems to be, I would say, the solution or at least a very important solution. As you can see uh, to the question, will COVID uh, impact negatively innovation? Uh, there is a, a, a majority that, that are, that are saying we disagree with this statement, when innovation will be the key leverage post-crisis, there is a large majority to see innovation as a solution uh, on the, on the post-crisis world. And last but not least, after leaving the, the floor uh, to, to, to Albert and to our panelists, uh, on the question of what is on top of the agenda of the current company regarding innovation. On cost cutting, uh, obviously, is one of the topic. But if you look uh, the other topics, it's also uh, all the topics that are coming on top of the list. Reallocation of the resources is also coming. But, and it was a, quite a surprise for us, all what is linked to breakthrough innovation, uh, is coming now on top of the list. Uh, actually, we want to go quicker and to make some uh, breakthrough innovation to deal with, uh, with the situation. And last but not least, uh, there will be uh, some reprioritization uh, in order to be more efficient on the services or on the products that we are delivering to the world. So this was a kind of, I would say, warm up for our session. And Albert, uh, please, please take, the, take the lead and uh, let's go through a certain level of, uh, and certain questions uh, that you have, uh, that you have, uh, that we have designed with, uh, with our panelists. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Vincent. Good evening, Sabine. Good, good evening, Hervé. So just a reminder for the people who have joined us uh, in the meantime, uh, we are together with uh, Sabine Klauke, who is head of engineering at Airbus Defense and Space, and also with uh, Hervé Gilibert, who is a CTO at Arium Group. Uh, thank you very much again to, uh, to, be, with, to be with us. Uh, maybe as a very, very short introduction, I just would like to you guys to remember that uh, over the last few months, uh, since the beginning of the uh, COVID crisis, but also uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the lockdown, uh, many very large companies have uh, innovated. And this innovation uh, took place in, uh, in various different ways. It could be uh, companies that launched actually new products. Uh, it can be companies that have hacked uh, existing products uh, to uh, fight COVID, uh, and I think most of us have in mind the uh, um, scuba diving uh, mask from Decathlon that was uh, hacked to make a, a breather. Uh, this is a second type of uh, innovation. And also, uh, there has been many companies that have used their capabilities to produce uh, stuff which is not necessarily very innovative in itself, such as masks, such as a, um, had hydroalcoholic uh, gel, these kind of things. And uh, some com companies have used their uh, industrial capabilities, for example, to, to uh, produce uh, these things to help us uh, fight the, um, the virus. And so uh, we are going to speak about uh, innovation, R&D, engineering uh, as a way uh, to recover uh, from this crisis. And for the people who are joining now, please stay tuned until the end of the webinar, because at the end of the webinar, we are going to reveal what are the uh, most important technologies that have appeared during the crisis and that will uh, be very important in the future. Uh, once again, thank you uh, a lot, Sabine. Thank you a lot, Hervé, to be with us today. Uh, the first theme uh, that I would like to address uh, with you guys uh, this evening is uh, in your opinion, uh, what is going to be the, uh, the role of uh, research and innovation, broadly speaking, uh, for the phase of uh, recovery? And maybe uh, we can start with, uh, with Sabine and then Hervé can build on, uh, build on it. Thank you, Albert, and hello, everybody, uh, tonight. Uh, yes, first of all, thanks for the inv invitation, and I'm really very happy to be here with a very good colleague of mine, Hervé, um, <clears throat> because for sure we are in the same ecosystem. Um, so I'm the head of engineering for Airbus Defense and Space, but I also have a long history in the group on the commercial aircraft side. And sometimes I will speak for the group, sometimes more for the defense and space side, because for sure the impact is, is just enormous for, uh, for our industry. So Looking at the recovery, I really would like to take two sentences about the crisis itself. Um, because for us, the first point was really, how do we react in the crisis? How do we survive? And, and here, first of all, I, I would say the creativity of the engineers was at the forefront as well. So first of all, safety, safety came first and we really had to organize uh, our working differently in order to manage to deliver and to, to as well to really deliver to customer value, to our commitments and to be able as well to secure the revenues in order to, to save the companies, if you wish. And that was the really very first point. And then, as you said, yes, there was a second part, which was really, what can we do on top? And there was a really strong agility and reactivity of the teams across the different countries because Airbus is, is, um, is forever um, European and, and really uh, dispersed in using ALM technologies to do uh, breathing masks, um, helping in, in co-creation very quickly coming together with different, uh, different types of companies to help in, in developing um, oxygen uh, generators for the uh, for the uh, for the medical areas, or even building mobile medical containers in order to help prepare hospitals. So, so things which are not really in our core 
uh, business, but which were uh, targeted into well, how can we use our know-how and expertise in helping the society. Over and above, for sure, we are an aircraft company and we used heavily our test uh, pilots and, and test aircraft fleets to as well bring masks from China into Europe and then into the different, uh, into the, into the different countries. So that was during the crisis. And it, it was really key for us to come up quickly into a setup, be it very dispersed and, and very, very diverse, to be able to deliver using different ways of working with our customers to be able to certify things even in a distant manner, um, have critical design reviews in, in the mobile way, uh, way of working. And that meant as well that we really had to ramp up our ability to, to work from home and to work um, even off of the, uh, of the offices, which is widely the case but it was augmented even in the very secured areas in which we are working as well. So then, first phase of that uh, crisis over, we really went into the cost cutting. And here, yes, the R&T and R&D in the wider sense needed to help with cost cutting. So that means that we really went into all our projects, we cut I would say by, yeah, we, we cut by 20 to even 30% in the different areas. In the first place to just safeguard the company. And this we did by actually classifying all our technology projects. We had the so-called do or die projects, which we definitely needed to go on with and wanted to, to safeguard. Then some others where we looked at rescheduling. So what could we push forward a little bit into the future, challenging the content. What are really the vital things? Do we need to fly everything? Can we do a test differently or really relook at the scope? And fourth, what are the things we can really put on hold? And that was, I think, key even for the future because now looking at all the, the different means, we can take that out again and, and have that classification and, and, and build our decisions based on that. So with this, we really learned in prioritizing, um, really turning the stones twice, looking at customer value even more, and as well coming to quicker decisions in terms of uh, fail fast. So yes, looking broadly in innovation, into innovation and, and technology, but being able to quicker funnel down uh, and be sure of the, of the technos we take. Thank you very much. Hervé. Thank you. Um, so, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm good to see you, Sabine. <laughs> but not, not, uh, not so much the case uh, in the recent, uh, in the recent <laughs> month. Uh, so, um, I, would, I will have a very similar answer from my side. Indeed, uh, in the very first days uh, of the crisis, uh, everything with our engineers uh, who had a very, very limited access to our sites was uh, about uh, creating solutions to support the ones that had to be supported with the, the crisis. So we had the same, our innovation hangars, we had one innovation hangar in each and every, uh, on each and every site uh, in our company. And uh, our innovation hangars, uh, our 3D printing machines were immediately uh, used by our people to create new devices uh, that were protection devices, uh, supports for helmets or, or whatever, uh, supports to, to, to lock, uh, to open the doors uh, without touching them uh, and so on. So this was fantastic. So uh, hydroalcoholic gel uh, also, uh, especially in, uh, in our teams in Kourou, where we have a chemical lab, uh, was immediately uh, a focus uh, for them. Uh, so this is the first uh, reaction and uh, we could see how our teams uh, can be mobilized, creative and uh, fast in, uh, in creating, which is uh, always good to see and good to take in that uh, circumstance. Then, uh, as was said by Sabine, the, uh, the next step was uh, unfortunately that uh, our R&D and R&T uh, budgets had to be used to support the resilience, the financial resilience uh, of our uh, uh, industrial companies, I speak in plural, 
this is a general. So this, the first aspect of the recovery phase of the support of R&D to the recovery phase is with the financial uh, aspect. Nevertheless, in our um, field of activity, uh, which is uh, space launchers, I think we have to be a bit more subtle when describing that. Um, we are, to some extent, uh, lucky uh, on the topic. And to explain that, I think we have to, to, to distinguish um, R&T and R&D. Um, in our domain, uh, R&D meaning the development uh, of a product, of a system, of a service that we deliver directly on, on the market. In our domain, R&D is, uh, uh, is requiring very, very high non-recurring costs, and it is paid by uh, space agencies uh, through everywhere in the, in the world. Uh, R&T is more dealing with low TRL, maturing technologies to bring them at the maturity level that will allow introducing them in our development, in our R&D uh, programs. Uh, and R&D in our model is uh, more self-funded and also supported, of course, uh, by uh, our dear uh, space uh, agencies. So uh, R&D, we have the chance that being supported by agencies, uh, having contracts, example given, this is the most fam famous example, of course, uh, these days, contracts to develop the Ariel 6 launcher, this contract has not disappeared. We have not lost the contract due to uh, the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, so we were not left uh, alone with, our, uh, uh, with ourselves uh, to, uh, to try to recover and to be resilient by ourselves only. We kept the support uh, uh, of our agencies for uh, the development activities. For the R&T activities, which are self-funded, this is different. And here, we did apply, and this is mandatory, and this, this has been done, uh, as we could see, by many uh, other companies around us. Uh, we have been uh, obliged to support the resilience of the company by cutting, by typically 30%, yes, uh, also. Uh, the, the budgets uh, we planned for this uh, year which corresponds also uh, to, uh, to the uh, amount of time that was blocked without uh, working, uh, okay? Uh, nevertheless, uh, this is not uh, only a matter of uh, delaying or reducing the budgets to, to cover the non-covered uh, phase. This was also a matter of, uh, I will not use uh, uh, the word sanitary measures, but we, we took some sanitary measures or we did sanitize, this is better, we did sanitize our portfolio uh, of projects in the same way as described by uh, Sabine. We have revisited it. Uh, the r &D and the R&D priorities have been uh, re reworked um, to focus much more uh, on our short-term goals, uh, what was in the pipe and what was about to, to, to leave the pipe uh, was privileged. Uh, to reduce uh, our more mid-term uh, goals, so less money, less goals, uh, of course. Uh, and we did also adapt our plans to um, the, the, the long-term consequences uh, or the fundamental consequences of the crisis as we could detect it uh, very early. Um, this, uh, so if I take two examples or to, to illustrate that <coughs> in a company like uh, ours, uh, we, this led us to quasi stop uh, our so-called industrial innovation. So we considered that uh, to, to make savings this year, uh, it was better to stop uh, our activities or to postpone, of course, our activities that were dealing with improving our uh, competitiveness, improving our industrial efficiency in the uh, in short to, to midterm, uh, because uh, there, there was one rationale, which is that this will require, uh, in the future, this will require, require capex that we might not have. Okay, so let's forget a bit. Another element of rationale is that this is not generating growth, uh, and uh, we did prefer to dedicate uh, the remaining money and to reprioritize our activities, to dedicate it uh, to uh, new domains or domains that have been boosted uh, by uh, the crisis. 
And uh, it is obvious for everybody that everything dealing about renewable uh, energy, everything dealing with um, uh, hydrogen, uh, particularly, uh, has become, uh, I would say, a must uh, for all companies uh, close to that uh, technological domain. And uh, by chance, we as uh, launchers, uh, designer, and manufacturer, we are handling hydrogen since more than 40 years. Uh, cryogenic uh, hydrogen. Uh, this is uh, really uh, our business, and we are used to transform hydrogen into uh, into uh, power, into uh, high levels uh, of energy in a safe uh, way, which is uh, of course a stake with uh, with that specify. Uh, so uh, we we clearly boosted our uh, future in the field of hydrogen. And this is something, by the way, that we uh, did, uh, that we are doing together with uh, Airbus and uh, with Safran Group. Uh, we have uh, uh, everyone in uh, in Europe, and here I'm just uh, quoting a, a French example. Uh, the French Civil uh, Aviation Agency, DGAC, uh, has launched together with Safran, Airbus, and us, uh, Ariane Group an initiative towards the uh, hydrogen propelled airplane uh, for, for the future. So we are uh, all together on that. And this obviously has been boosted uh, at, uh, at the end of the crisis, uh, at the end of the confinement uh, period. This leads me also just to, to highlight one point, uh, which in my view has really to be stressed. This is the support we have by the public sector on all these topics so this uh, it is uh, absolutely outstanding to see how much each uh, national agency or each public uh, agency in each uh, country and also the european union uh, have uh, taken all measures to really support uh, the move in the direction i've just mentioned hydrogen is an example but more generally renewable uh, energy, everything dealing with uh, data, artificial intelligence, uh, every, everyone knows that uh, very well, has been really boosted. And this is a remarkable consequence, which leads me to, to conclude that uh, R&D will not only uh, support our short-term resilience with uh, this mechanical financial uh, aspect, but also by boosting now the transition to, to the next world. This is obvious. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, both uh, Sabine and Hervé. That's uh, super interesting. Um, so, um, of course, you said many interesting things. Uh, what I liked uh, from uh, uh, Sabine's explanation is the fact that despite the fact that you guys had to uh, cut costs and, and stuff, you had a key learning, which is uh, we learned how to prioritize in a very efficient and rapid manner. And Hervé, uh, the thing that you said about uh, hydrogen is actually leading us to the second theme, theme that I would like to discuss with you. And before jumping to this uh, second theme, uh, which has to do with uh, acceleration of trends, uh, I just like, would like to welcome the, uh, the new participants that have just uh, joined us. Uh, we are a few hundred people now. And I would like to remind uh, the participants that uh, you have the possibility to ask questions to our guests. Uh, so please use, don't hesitate to use the, the Q&A to ask questions. And going back to the, the second theme, so you said, Hervé, that uh, the crisis had accelerated the transition towards uh, uh, using hydrogen, etc. Um, I was wondering, do you see uh, the acceleration or on the contrary, the, uh, uh, do you see that certain trends have been accelerated or on the other way, uh, trends which have been stopped by the crisis? Well, the, the, the point I would uh, stress uh, at first, and I will keep only one point not to be uh, too, too long, uh, is about our, our ways of working. There has been uh, drastic evolutions uh, of our ways of working, which was made mandatory by the, the situation, and for, from which we have to draw lessons uh, now. Um, the, the experience we had is that, obviously, um, our engineers could not work on site for, for a while. Uh, they, we had to, to find uh, solutions uh, to, to, to have remote work uh, done efficiently. We were a little bit suspicious uh, and we were worrying about that 
at uh, the very beginning. And in the very first days, maybe in the three, four uh, first weeks uh, of the period, uh, we had a good surprise, which is that uh, we, we, we stated that we kept a very high level of efficiency. Uh, the productivity of our engineering teams was uh, not bad uh, at all, uh, much better than what we were believing. And we did realize uh, that up just after, we did realize that this was due to one thing. This is that these people were just doing uh, the job they had uh, as a duty that they had in their backlog. Uh, that they were focused on uh, what they could do individually. So they were solving uh, uh, and tackling all the actions they had individually and that they could solve individually. Good progress in their individual uh, production. However, after some time, typically three, four weeks, we started to see that uh, then uh, the machine was much less uh, efficient. And there was the need that uh, people interact, interact sorry, uh, with uh, each other. So the lack of interaction was uh, obvious. Uh, and on topics like ours, uh, designing uh, launcher, uh, Aria 6 launcher under development today, it is obvious that, that by essence, this is a matter of uh, co-working. This is a matter of collaboration between various disciplines. This is a matter of multifunctional teams, of plateau, the people work on the plateau. And so the, this collaboration was affected by the non-collocation uh, of people. So we have not yet drawn, of course, people have come back uh, at work and we have organized that. Uh, I would say that we have not yet drawn uh, all uh, the consequences uh, of that uh, statement. Uh, but it is obvious for us that we will have to, we will have to take benefit of that to organize the work differently, to find a way to have time, to have moments when people are alone, are not disturbed by meetings, by uh, whatever, which is of less value added for what they have to, to deliver. And moments when people are together, the collocation and the co-working is, uh, is essential. And when saying that, this uh, brings me to, to speak a little bit about uh, the uh, so-called agile uh, ap approach for, for management. Uh, it is obvious that the Scrum or Scrum at scale or whatever uh, frameworks that have been uh, very well formalized and uh, that, are, that are very well practiced and that were, uh, I would say, uh, entering in our companies. I know that this is uh, already a lot the case with Airbus. This is the case since uh, one year in our company. We realized that this method, uh, this approach uh, with uh, sprint phases, uh, example, even, uh, are uh, really, uh, are probably a solution uh, to uh, cope with what I mentioned before as a difficulty, uh, while, and this is something we had already experienced just before the crisis, while really leveraging uh, in a very spectacular man manner our collective uh, efficiency on, on projects. Okay, thank you very much, Hervé. Uh, Sabine, would you, would you like to build on top of uh, Thank you. Yeah, I, I would actually really like to build on, on what uh, Hervé said. Um, yes, teletravail and, and, and we really changed uh, our habits there. And I have to say that this really brought us to more empowerment and trust as well. Because these are things which we are trying to push in terms of the leadership in a big company like Airbus, for sure, it's not always the, the easiest. And we had a lot of pilots, but was it generalized? Here in the time where everybody needed to work from home, we really built a lot of trust that yes, we could be efficient. And in some areas it was e even more efficient than, than in usual office times. And for sure, this brought directly the point up, okay, how can we profit from this even after the crisis? And how can we generalize these things and maybe uh, really rework on our cost basis? And we have directly after the crisis brought this into pilot cases. And, um, and I really want to uh, yeah, first underline as well what Ari said. After the first weeks, so we, we took a very much top-down crisis approach, same rules for everybody in the, in the company. Um, this with over uh, 35,000 people is, is 
somewhat unoptimized. So we had shifts for everybody, blue and red, to, to make sure the, we keep the health uh, rules uh, inside. That was generalized because we were really in a crisis mode. When we could open up a bit, we could really give flexibility to the teams. And that was really what made the difference because in a company like Airbus Defense and Space, we have a large variety of products and projects. And that meant that there, was, there wasn't one fits all. And we then discovered when the team could organize themselves to see how much presence time or when they would need to meet and how they would organize that in a manner where, where health and safety measures were, were applied, then they could really excel. And then they were really happy with the setup. So based and building on that, we, we had pilot cases in all the different sites and uh, we are really happy here in Toulouse. We were just finishing a new building and we were just about to move in. And finally, we took this time during COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So we took the time during the crisis and just after the crisis to in record time have the outputs taken into reality. So actually, we have the first teams moving in just now, but they will move in with not generalized office um, uh, desks anymore. And they have organized themselves to say, okay, let's reduce by 30%, uh, but see what is our solution. And we just had the review today. It's really, really building trust into the, into the teams as well. So we really used it as well to give the teams the opportunity um, uh, to build on themselves. And even the, the managers which were doubting that we could really be efficient and, and working uh, in this manner are now completely convinced. Um, so these are first pilots. We want to generalize this, um, but it's an important point. Uh, everyone was talking about agile and here we had a real adaptation because we have internal agile coaches and we are we are building on that method for for some time and especially in the software areas and the team had to completely change from yes very much um, uh, localized ways of working into a completely remote way even in the coaching side and and that was for sure a step as well with the customers with the partners we had a lot of uh, yeah, remote ways of working that were that were that were put in place, and and these ones will also stay. Like, can we do supplier surveillance by video? We don't have to travel all the time, and 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 these are little things which are which are really very efficient, which will stay. And I already mentioned the way how we do acceleration is, I would think, much more streamlined than than what we had before. And that's, 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 that's a gain, which is just a habit right now. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, once again, super interesting. We have started receiving quite a few questions in the, the Q&A. Uh, we will not have time to take them all, of course, but uh, uh, there, is, uh, there are several questions related to, um, did you see if uh, the, the crisis has the increased the pace of the digital transformation whether it's at the level of the uh, uh, R&D department or at the uh, global, uh, global level of the company. And this is something that we may also discuss a little bit later on during the, uh, the discussion, but I would like to hear your thought briefly on that. For me, two points in this, uh, really in the, in the digitalization side. So on one hand, I mean, there was this in immediate need and, and I, I think we were laughing because we were both uh, thinking about <laughs> uh, uh, a little um, joke. This question about who pushed digitalization in the company. Was it the CEO, the DTO <laughs> or was it COVID? And, and yes, we augmented the number of VPNs and, and external clients and even the number of laptops uh, dramatic, uh, dramatically. Uh, in the very first days of the COVID. So that definitely um, was a step. Is that the only answer to digitalization? For sure not. And um, for us, there is two other areas on which, which I, I would like to build. The one is 
really end-to-end -end digitalization as one real ambition in, in our research and technology world. We call that end-to-end -end digital design, manufacturing and service, which is really the next step in the, in the way we, we digitalize our processes, our internal processes. And, and we are pushing very much on that. Um, so has it accelerated since the crisis? I would say we have again focused much more and, and that's, and as it is one of the big ambitions, this one will have a, a highway, let's say. And as well, the part of artificial intelligence, secure clouds, especially in the environment of defense and space, the secure cloud uh, subject is key. Um, and that's again one of the when one of the ambitions that we have today the only solutions in this area in the cloud areas are basically um american or chinese here we in the, in as a european uh, sovereign um industry we have to catch up and this is definitely one of the areas we will focus on all right, so we'll go a little bit deeper in the technology side in the, the end of uh, the webinar. Uh, Hervé, would you like to say a few words about the digital transformation also? Well, in fact, um, Ariane Group is, um, is not a company that develops uh, anything uh, as a service or as products uh, delivered to customers based on the digital solutions. Of course, uh, our rockets uh, have a flight software, which is a very sophisticated one, uh, uh, this is obvious. Um, so we are more users than we were. Uh, I like the, uh, the joke by Sabine. Uh, we, we were um, more, uh, really, uh, uh, we were subject to a real transformation uh, of our IT infra infrastructure, uh, which was boosted as it has never been. And we reached uh, new services for our employees that, were, uh, that we were not expecting uh, before many months uh, from now. So this was much more uh, a boost in the, uh, in the service provided internally to, to our employees. And this was obviously, uh, this was mandatory due to the need to, to work uh, much more remotely and to be uh, connected, uh, being uh, each of us far from the other ones. So. Thank you very much. Uh, there are many other very interesting questions. One of them being, and I'm not going to ask it to you uh, because I think we will, uh, have a specific webinar later on on this particular question, but uh, I'm just telling you what the question was because I think it's it's quite interesting. Uh, so you mean you both mentioned before that um, hydrogen had been uh, the pace of uh, adoption of uh, of the uh, hydrogen had been uh, uh, accelerated, and at the same time we saw that the crisis has made the um, price of oil uh, going uh, down uh, very drastically. So there is a strong incentive now that the price of oil is so low to uh, use uh, uh, this kind of uh, energy sources. So how hydrogen is going to be, uh, to be competitive. But this is going to be another webinar, uh, <laughs> teasing for the next time. Um, the uh, third uh, theme that uh, I wanted to, to discuss with you was uh, related to uh, the geography. Uh, we have seen uh, during the crisis that uh, many companies in various sectors were not able to uh, deliver anymore because uh, part of the supply chain, uh, part of the people, etc., uh, was in other countries and where with the um, travel bans, uh, it was getting fairly complicated. So I was wondering, what are your views in terms of what is the future of uh, research and innovation, which is today for most companies, uh, it tends to be global to some extent. Do you think RNI is going to re uh, become more centralized, more uh, local? What are your views on that? And so I start maybe. Okay. Start. Uh, I mean, for Airbus, it is basically in the dna we have always been not centralized in in it's and especially in development this is a quite rare situation um you named it a lot of the times especially the the engineering uh, the r and t and r and d is very 
very much centralized. And we always had it across the nations. And I think we have learned over the years really to take that as an asset. And this, this will continue. I guess that we can maybe travel a little bit less because we've learned how to cope uh, uh, differently with the, with, the, with, the, um, uh, with the geographical situation. As well, we are a European company, but we were reaching, uh, very much reaching out worldwide uh, for innovations, for we have innovation centers in China, in America, everywhere. Um, and I think this trend will go on. That was an asset as well, because actually, yes, in some areas we learned, we heavily learned in China how to cope with the COVID before it actually stroke uh, heavily Europe. Europe. And you mentioned the supply chain. Yes, um, we, uh, it was very difficult. But we have to say that we had a very strong surveillance together with our partners and to see that, that the supply chain would work. Um, and that actually worked pretty well. Um, we didn't have any real disruptions for sure. Our demand went down as well. So we are not foreseeing big changes there, probably more in the day-to-day -day life and how, how the interactions work. So um, here we would rather uh, go into even more digital and interactive, um, but building on, on the strength of a more dispersed um, R and T and and especially R and T uh, situation. Today, the the technology trends and for us, for instance, electrification batteries in satellites and and then uh, now as well in in aircraft for sure are a key one. I cannot imagine to just uh, look at this in a, in a very local manner. Here we are worldwide uh, scanning uh, the market for uh, for years. And that's really a key asset as well. For uh, the, the rocket company, Ariane Group, the, the question this is a little bit like uh, you know, digital. Uh, some minutes ago, it is a bit less relevant because basically we, we are uh, much less global than, uh, than Airbus. We are basically a European company, uh, German and French uh, company. Uh, so re-internalization uh, of uh, activities from everywhere in the world to Europe is not uh, a question uh, for us. We are already uh, based in Europe and we have almost everything uh, of our uh, products done, uh, designed, mm -hmm. developed uh, and uh, produced in, um, in Europe. Uh, our supply chain is totally in Europe. There are few exceptions, very few exceptions. Uh, which are not uh, dramatic, they do not put us at risk. And uh, the exceptions that deserve a specific attention, in fact, are uh, more in the field of very uh, specific components uh, on uh, our products uh, that, are, uh, that have been identified even before the crisis as being strategic and for which um, an insourcing, a re-insourcing approach in Europe uh, has uh, already been launched before uh, the crisis to keep these strategic assets or to have strategic assets, strategic sources, sorry, in, uh, in Europe uh, also. But this is a move that had been engaged uh, before. It will uh, go on. It might be accelerated. In my view, this is uh, probable, but this is a re relatively minor uh, aspect uh, quantitatively uh, of our business. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to welcome the, uh, the additional viewers that have joined us since the beginning of the session. I just uh, also would like to remind you that we are together with uh, Sabine Klauke, who is head of engineering at Airbus Defense and Space, and with uh, Hergé, Hervé Gilibert, who is CTO at Iron Group, and we are discussing about the role of innovation in the recovery phase. And uh, now we have two themes uh, left uh, to discuss in the remaining, let's say, 15 minutes. Um, so the, uh, the next theme is uh, related to uh, disruptive innovation. Uh, we have mentioned earlier during this session that uh, there has been some uh, cuts in R&D budgets. So now if we 
if we zoom on uh, disruptive innovation, do you think that in the short term, uh, disruptive innovation is going to be uh, uh, negatively impacted by the crisis? Or on the contrary, would you like to uh, uh, strengthen the, uh, these uh, disruptive innovations, which are for the long term, for the transformation of the company? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> This time, this time for me. <laughs> Go ahead, Evie. <laughs> so, well, it's a bit hard to say. In fact, and I think this depends on the, on the domain. Um, I would um, I would uh, differentiate two 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 domains to, to make it simple. Uh, there there is everything which is about digital and digital related uh, activities or technologies. Uh, digital related meaning uh, including uh, everything about data about artificial intelligence. This will not be um, a victim of the COVID crisis. These, these domains uh, for, for sure will be uh, very much boosted and we, we see it uh, already. Then uh, in terms of uh, disruptive technologies regarding more uh, hardware uh, technologies, hardware related technologies, um, development of disruptive systems, integrated systems involving hardware and video. In my view, uh, these domains will be uh, penalized in general. Uh, this will be the case particularly in, uh, in large companies due to the reduction of the R&T budgets that I mentioned uh, before to, to support the financial resilience. But uh, this domain will be penalized also in, uh, in the SMEs uh, in the startups, uh, in my view, uh, because these are activities which are uh, producing results, uh, outcomes in, in a much slower manner than uh, the digital uh, related uh, activities. And these are activities to make it short, which are capital intensive. And what we can see uh, in that field, uh, staying on the startups for, for a while, uh, well, what we could see uh, in the recent weeks is a move from uh, the venture capitalist uh, actors uh, in such a way that they are reducing or they are concentrating, which means reducing uh, overall uh, the budgets dedicated to Series A uh, investment and uh, more uh, going on with their previous investment, uh, supporting the growth of the startups that have been uh, successful after the, the, the first uh, steps. Uh, so this is a general trend we can see. So in my view, uh, there is a risk today uh, for the startups belonging to the so-called deep tech uh, area uh, that uh, less startups uh, will, uh, will, uh, will appear in our landscape uh, in, uh, in the future. However, to balance that, uh, it is obvious that um, everyone, uh, especially startups in, in our countries, in Germany, it is true in, uh, in France, uh, will be strongly supported by uh, public financial support. Uh, they will be strongly supported, uh, we see it in Germany, we see it in France, we see it on the European level, by uh, the so-called rebound plans uh, that, have, that are being uh, implemented. And the ones uh, beyond the ones dealing with digital matters that I mentioned earlier, the ones who are uh, dealing with the domains that were promising before uh, the crisis, uh, these ones, uh, in my view, will uh, have, might have uh, an accelerated uh, development. And the domains that were identified as the key ones, uh, the promising ones for, for the future, if uh, are given to an analysis which uh, was done, in my, my memory is correct, in 2017 uh, by uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, there are three areas uh, in our uh, environment uh, which will be, uh, which will face um, a development, uh, an exponential development in uh, the 10, uh, 20, 30 coming years. Uh, this is everything which is about renewable uh, energy, about the protection of the planet. This is everything which is about data. Uh, data management, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on again. And this is also space. So the, the last one, I like it very much, uh, of course, 
this is also space and space all the more has the uh, particularity uh, to be an enabler for the two first ones an enabler for everything about uh, identification of the planet of space uh, and uh, this is also uh, an enabler for the development uh, of the data data centers that uh, clouds so clouds in space <laughs> let's say uh, in the future so uh, in my view, in these three domains, uh, disruptive innovation might be accelerated, um, maybe not immediately, but um, as this is uh, on the long term, uh, the, uh, a natural evolution uh, we will uh, see um, in the, uh, the, the, for our future. Um, the, uh, the fact that each and every investor today is much more selective than before. Obviously, should privilege should lead to uh, uh, favor these uh, areas. Yes. First of all, I would really like to to remind how big this crisis is, and especially for our sector, be it aerospace as a whole, uh, then maybe defense and this and space in a, in a bit a different manner. It is a huge crisis, and it will not be a, a quick ramp up. It will be a slow and a long uh, ramp up. So, and first of all, I would really like to thank the governments and our governments for their help plans, industry helping plans, be it on the very short term uh, measures like short time work, like, um, like things they can buy. But on the other hand, for us, mainly as well for our customers. So we didn't ask really for a lot of help directly, but we asked for the help to our customers. And I just remind uh, in France, in Germany, the big airlines, they have, have had huge packages. And this is for sure helping the sector and helping us as well again. Now, if we talk about, um, and then the second, uh, second area now is on the research and technology plans where there is huge plans of, uh, of boosting uh, the industries as well. And here we come to uh, the, the dis disruptive, let's say, fields or the, the innovation fields. And I think here, yes, they take uh, priorities. And one is on the whole field of electrification, hydrogen, and not only in, in the way of fuel cells, but also in the, in the way of combustion with hydrogen. And then if you look further, it's as well the whole question of how we can produce green hydrogen in a, in a, in a volume that is needed for, uh, for, in, for industrial needs. Um, because we are far from, from having anything uh, which would be sufficient. Um, <clears throat> and here, let me give you maybe three examples. One of the real, of the, of the commercial aerospace then and then one uh, in the defense and, and one in the more space uh, related area. So we are trying to keep um, disruptive innovation, as I said, a bit more prioritized, a bit more focused. And we are trying to continue to work with the startups and with a wide, uh, wide, wide um, uh, field through big projects. And then hydrogen is the one I would like to, to highlight really uh, for the aerospace side, because for now a couple of years, we have been starting to really look in what would be the next future airplane um, and what do we need to do in terms of steps to really get to, to a green aircraft of the future, because uh, we will have to become more sustainable in this, in this whole industry field. And after the COVID immediately, it was clear that we couldn't sustain our programs in the pace that we wanted to have. Here the governments will help because this is one of their, uh, their fields as well that they push. And we are really trying to then take, let's say the coordination, not only with us, we are far too slow and far too heavy uh, to go quick here, but we, we never thought we would go into a field like um, hydrogen, uh, industrial um, uh, industrial making. This is one of the fields which we are now taking on together with the uh, with the industry and with the with the different regions, 
in order to bring it forward because nobody else is doing it. And because if we really want to do a step, we are going into, uh, we have to, somebody has to push it. So here, I think we are taking the responsibility and we are trying to really bring the, the whole sector into it and keeping the, the startups as well with us. A second example is, is on the defense side and, and you probably know that there are big initiatives from the European players to be heard and to be a player in the, in the geographical and in the, in, the, in the geopolitical field, we need to um, invest and we need to do projects. And two big projects are emerging in the European uh, combination. And the one is called Future Combat Air, Air System. And it's not about an aircraft, but it's about an overall system. And this is one of the innovation fields where we really push for sovereignty because, um, because it's needed and it's needed in the, in the overall geopolitical uh, situation. And where we, our vision is to build really an overall system where we can have the multiple assets playing together and where we need then efficient data management. Um, and this is bringing the secure cloud, we call it multi-domain combat cloud. Um, in 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 the in the center, and this is where we are working with the whole system of uh, of startups as well, and where we are very open to really bring the whole uh, the whole ecosystem into play, in order to build this European uh, solution, which would then be able as well to to um, to shine and to and to swap over into the commercial side. Space, you named it. Is, is another area where, where our home countries can really help us, where we need sovereignty and where we had a huge invest um, uh, f f just these days into the whole telecommunication field on one hand, where it's about bigger constellations to really bring the, the connectivity market forward. Um, and, uh, and which is actually securing an innovation which, which was done over the last couple of of years where it was about creating uh, constellations and smaller smaller um, telecom satellites would, 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 which would work in, in constellations and which would completely commercialize as well this whole sector talking about one web um, where here really the the European governments have positioned themselves to safeguard it and, and to and to pull it forward so very good and positive sign here and on the other hand um, there is uh, a huge program of scientific, scientific programs coming up, which was decided before COVID, but this is for sure as well nurturing um, disruptive innovation, because in the space area and specifically in the science field, we always are on the edge of technology and on the possibilities um, in order to bring uh, the, the newest uh, things forward and in, in order as well to really make the missions possible. Here we are talking about air observation and, and a lot of satellites and missions which are directly impacting our knowledge about our planet and as well about our ways how we can influence our own acts. So I think in, in combination, yes, um, uh, disruptive innovation will go forward. It will still be much more focused. And as Ave said, there might be areas where it's much more difficult to have the globality of players uh, in the front, but we are trying to help pulling this still uh, with bigger projects, uh, then everything will need to be focused around these. Excellent. So that's a very good news that uh, disruptive innovation is the dead. Uh, I'm very happy about that. Uh, we are a little bit uh, behind schedule, but it is so interesting that I think we should uh, um, we should keep going a little bit. So for the viewers who are uh, with us, uh, and I know that there are quite a, quite a lot actually, uh, we'll be maybe 10 minutes late, just so you know. Um, we will make it short. Just before giving, giving the floor back to Vincent for the wrap up, the last uh, question that I wanted to ask you, we, uh, was related to technologies. We have already, uh, you guys have mentioned the, the importance of, uh, uh, within this digital context, you have mentioned the importance of having a European uh, 
um, a European cloud. You have mentioned the importance of uh, hydrogen. Now, if you had to pick one technology, just one to make it short, uh, that appeared to be super important uh, during the crisis, uh, which technology would it be? During the crisis, it's all about data again. Yes, uh, it's about quick data linkage, digitalization. That's for sure the much more short-term thing which we had during and which we could already sense during the crisis. Um, the hydrogen is a, is a far bigger subject and, and therefore a longer term. So um, we couldn't sense it too much, unfortunately, during the crisis. What we could sense is that all of a sudden uh, pollution, pollution was going down. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it, it gave a good, a good ambition there uh, to make that, uh, that our target. Excellent. Hervé, what are your thoughts? So, so, during the crisis, I would say, uh, uh, rather say uh, after the crisis or just after the crisis, so not speaking again of hydrogen, which was done extensively uh, until now, uh, maybe one, one subject, uh, in my view, will uh, benefit from uh, period to come and this uh, we can see uh, the very first signs uh, very clearly today this is everything about uh, the improvement of industrial efficiency uh, in our factories uh, through um, uh, robotics the, the robotization of our uh, industry uh, is uh, obviously uh, accelerating uh, but this is not limited to our industry this is more general we are all discovering uh, how much it would be good in the future to be resilient to such uh, a situation as the one we have been facing with our factories not able to, to host uh, our employees, to be resilient by having um, maybe not uh, fully automated uh, robots uh, to, to do the job, but uh, at least uh, tele-operated uh, robots. And we see that everywhere around us. Uh, until now, this was our vision of our factories, I will not be too long, uh, of our factories in 2030, when we project our views to 2030, uh, our factories uh, will be equipped with uh, very flexible robotic systems. Uh, I think this will come uh, earlier than what we were uh, believing uh, until now. So one effect, again, one positive effect uh, of the crisis, and we of course, all have to be positive uh, after this, uh, this crisis and see the benefits we will draw from, from it. Thank you very much. So uh, we have covered the five themes that uh, we had prepared. Thank you very much. And I will give you uh, the floor back to uh, Vincent Bauberger, who is a managing partner of the Paris office at Arthur Little, uh, for the, the wrap up and the conclusion. Thank you, Albert. Thank you to, for this very interesting uh, discussion and, and inputs. My key takeaways of this discussion uh, are the following. First of all, I was quite surprised about how fast uh, the big organization uh, get adapted. Uh, when we were discussing about Airbus or, or, or Iron Group, we have always an image of something uh, quite difficult to move. And uh, suddenly with the COVID, it seemed that everything was quite easy uh, to move and uh, that uh, a lot of things was feasible. So this was my first takeaway. After that, regarding uh, the main outputs of, uh, of the discussion, first of all, on the decision-making processes, I was surprised all, uh, on the ability of, of the world focus. Uh, actually, you were very much focused on what was really important and it has boost on the decision-making processes, uh, the ability to keep uh, selective on uh, what you need to do and what you need uh, to stop to do, which is, which is I think, uh, also a, a key takeaway. Second topic on culture and organization, the, 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 what the, the words that come out of the discussion was power and trust, because you were more or less obliged to rely on the, on the, on the, on the people and it has worked. Agility, boosting digitization, a new way of working, and actually globalization, because uh, you travel less, so it's actually it's much more easy to work uh, globally in a certain sense. And the last topic on the technology, we were discussing on this, and we and actually in the discussion 
we understood that there was a huge link between the support of the government and your own interest. So actually what was favored in the, in the different technology was more or less all what is green. Uh, hydrogen uh, obviously was, uh, is one of the topics. All what is linked to the, to the data and especially the secure cloud and the topic of sovereignty linked to data is coming on top of the, of, of the mind in this area. Third topic is more or less uh, Earth observation, space industry, I would say what is happening to, to our planet. And, and this is back on top of the priorities. And last but not least is what I can call the unmanned uh, technology, how to make the world more resilient to uh, something that we are facing. So this was in a nutshell the, the key takeaways that I that I grasped in this discussion. Once again, it was very interesting in my in my view. I want I wish to thank you both and thank you Albert for the for the moderation uh, and thank you all of the attendees for participating to, the, to this webinar. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye.